Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Shin, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, Chairman Choi and President Park, it's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure to join you this morning to share with you my knowledge um, about semiconductor technology and how we need to uh, innovate more quickly with a new paradigm to meet the promise of AI technology. So my presentation should be uh, <laughs> showing here. All right. So this is um, the title of my talk, A New Paradigm for Advancing Computing Beyond the Limits of Moore's Law. So over the last 50 years, we have seen the, the rapid advancement of information and communication technology for the benefit of uh, society. Um, and this has really been driven, this progress has been driven by Moore's Law, but you might have heard that there's some limits to Moore's Law, and we are coming close to those limits. And so in the future, for continued innovation, uh, we really need to have a new way of innovation. So that's my title for this talk. So I realized not everybody here is a, has earned a PhD in electrical engineering, and so I thought I should provide some basic, uh, some fundamental background information on integrated circuit, you know, microchip technology advancement following Moore's Law and explain to you why there's some fundamental limits to Moore's Law. Then we can talk about a new paradigm for continuing to advance integrated circuit technology to meet the, the, the promise um, of di you know, digital transformation for the benefit of society. So Moore's Law, um, this, this graph here was taken, is taken from the paper published in 1965 by Mr. Gordon Moore, who's a co-founder of Intel Corporation. This chart shows um, the cost of manufacturing a transistor as a function of the number of transistors on a chip. Now, an uh, integrated microchip has many um, switches. These are called transistors. And the smaller the transistors are, the more you can fit on a chip. But if you try to manufacture the chip uh, to have too many transistors, so the transistors are too small or packed too tightly together, the manufacturing process might not yield of all functional chips. So this is why eventually if you try to make too many chips on a, on a, too many transistors on a chip, the cost per transistor starts to go up because the manufacturing process cannot yield uh, functional chips. But as we advance the technology, let me just get used to this, we can actually re, uh, incre improve the precision of the manufacturing process. And this way we can make more and more transistors on a chip with high manufacturing yield. So over time, this is, um, the curves move to the right because we can actually manufacture more and more transistors on a microchip and to still have it function. And so Moore's law is really an economic law. How do we minimize the cost of manufacturing um, these components? So over time, if we can advance the technology to make smaller and smaller transistors, to fit more and more transistors on an integrated circuit chip, the chip becomes more functional. We have lower cost per function. And this enables engineers to design new products and to grow new markets for electronics. And companies like SK, uh, Hynix, can make a profit, invest the profit into further advancing the technology to make it more precise so that we can continue to increase more, more and more transistors on a chip. So over time, this plot shows the number of transistors on a chip. This is a log plot, so 1,000 is down here. One, 10 billion is up here. So over time, over the last 50 years, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit chip has steadily increased at an exponential pace because every two years or so, a new generation of technology comes out and we can double the number of transistors manufactured on a chip with high yield. So today, the most advanced integrated circuit products have over 20 billion transistors on a chip that's maybe the size of your thumbnail. So the transistors are really nanometer scale today. So it's a very um, impressive accomplishment over many years uh, due to advancements in manufacturing technology. Now most of us in society might not care about the number of transistors on a microchip. What's more important is really how many computing devices are there in the world? How much um, benefit are we gaining uh, from, from this technology? So this chart shows the number of computing devices as a function of time and shows how it has also grown exponentially. 
So starting in the early, in the 60s, there were very large mainframe computers that filled up an entire room. Today we have smartphones um, that are mobile, connected to the internet. So due to the steady increase in the number of devices we can fit on a chip and the, in, the improved functionality opens up new markets. And so the size of these dots is increasing because the functionality of our smartphones today is much greater than even the mainframe computers um, in the past. So if we project into the future, today we have over 10 billion computing devices in the world, more than the number of people in the world. But this is a exponential plot. The number of devices, computing devices in the world within the next 10 years will be much larger than the number of people in the world. And this is what we refer to as the Internet of Things. Everything that we interact with will have um, some computing capability to interact with the environment and to communicate with other things in the environment and with us. So we project that in the future there will be over 100 billion devices or even 1 trillion devices within the next 20 uh, years. And so this is much larger number than the number of people. And so a lot of this will be, have to be uh, operating autonomously without interference from people. So the Internet of Things, um, more and more intelligence is going to be at the edge of the cloud. This is what we, so today we have high performance computing available um, wirelessly and also wired um, in the cloud. And we have devices in our homes, in our offices, that we can do high uh, performance computing. But the devices that we wear, the devices we carry, they also are going to become more and more capable. And even the devices in our home, like controlling the heat and the lighting, are going to be smart. So in the, and some people envision that we things that we wear, our clothes, um, our watches, our jewelry, even inside us, we will have devices. You know, so this is the vision for the future. So as technology um, developers, one thing we realize is that um, one major requirement for, future, for, for us to realize the future potential of uh, computing technology is to dramatically not only enhance the, continue to enhance the functionality of these computing devices, but the energy efficiency. So as one example, um, uh, Chairman Choi mentioned, you know, um, we would like to minimize the carbon footprint Right, of electronic devices. So there was a study done recently that just a single artificial intelligence training model, just to train a um, computing uh, system to be able to, let's say, recognize um, objects, that cre uses up enough electricity to generate carbon emissions equivalent to six automobiles in one year. Okay, so the amount of carbon emissions um, generated by six automobiles in one year that's how, much that's how much carbon emissions is associated with just training one AI model. So it's very clear that if we want to have AI pervasive everywhere, we really need to enhance the energy efficiency of computing devices. Now, these billions of devices, uh, billions of transistors on a chip, how do we design such a complex system? Well, over the last 50 years, the industry has developed this hierarchical system um, of abstraction. So, uh, the people who designed the transistors down here are not the same people who designed the microchips. The people who designed the, the software um, are not the same people who designed the computer architecture. We divide, it in the, the, we divide the work, the advancement, into dis different layers. So we have experts in materials, like my colleagues here. We have experts in transistor design. We have experts in circuit design and computer architects and also software engineers who work in their own layers. And basically what the industry has done is that, well, we know that we can continue to follow Moore's law to have improvements in transistor performance. So the people who design the architectures and the al algorithms just um, count on that steady progress. So what we have, what the industry did in the past years is develop technology roadmaps. So this international technology roadmap for semiconductors that states, okay, in what year will the transistor be this small and how many transistors on a chip? And we project, everybody agrees that we will make progress in, in the transistors and circuits. That way the people who design the chips and the people who design the software can plan ahead to make sure that products are introduced on time. Okay, 
So this is the hierarchy today. And so people who design the transistors don't really pay attention to what happens in the software layer. And maybe people who design transistors will interact with people who design circuits. But, so this is what we call co-design, but it's really just limited to just interacting with people that are very close in, your, in the layer abstraction model. So this is really what we call the backbone of artificial intelligence. Because of this abstraction hier hierarchy, um, people ha can develop new products every year with billions of components successfully. And it's because of this um, hierarchy. Okay, so let me tell you now, to understand the fundamental limits of Moore's Law, I need to review some basic information about how a transistor uh, functions. So this is a cartoon of a transistor. It's a three-terminal device. The current flowing between two terminals, the source and the drain, inside the semiconductor material, is controlled by the voltage, electric potential, uh, applied to this gate electrode. Now this gate electrode is electrically insulated from the semiconductor surface here by a thin oxide layer. So it's a, usually, in the past, it was silicon dioxide. So, this is, so the gate is metallic, so this is why we call it a metal oxide semiconductor device. And when you put a voltage on the gate relative to the source, that induces an electric field and that causes the transistor to turn on if the gate voltage is higher than some threshold. So if you increase the gate voltage above some th minimum threshold voltage, the current can flow between the source and drain electrodes. So this is a field effect transistor. This is a cross-sectional view, um, mic micrograph of a MOSFET, and this minimum feature size, the gate length, today is now uh, approaching 10 nanometers. Okay, in this e example here, this is about 30 nanometers. So for just a general audience, um, all you need to know is that a transistor is supposed to function as a digital switch, like this. It can either be on or off. If, and if it's off, that means the gate voltage is less than the threshold voltage. However, if you look at the current on a logarithmic scale, the current does not go to zero at the threshold voltage. It exponentially decreases towards zero but even with zero volts applied to the gate voltage, there's some non-zero leakage current. The transistor will always have some current, allow some current to flow between the source and drain, um, even when there's no voltage applied to the gate. Now, the maximum voltage you can apply to an uh, integrated ch circuit chip we call VDD. So VDD determines really how much current the transistor conducts in the on state. Okay, so that's the on state current. Well, right there. So, in reality, this is the better model for a transistor. The more you slide this up and down, that means the more you change the gate voltage, the bigger the difference between on current and off current. All right, so now to save power, if we want to save energy for the computer chips, we need to operate at lower voltage. Oops, excuse me. So we would like to operate at lower VDD. We'd like to reduce that. But if we reduce VDD, then the on state current decreases. Okay, so it's not conducting current very well. Now we can design a transistor to have a lower threshold voltage to get the high on state current. However, this means then that the leakage current goes up exponentially. So there's a fundamental trade off in the ability of the transistor to work as a switch and the energy efficiency. Now today you might have heard about CMOS technology, complementary MOS. So let me explain to you. So today at the computer chips, we, c we encode information in digital format. So information is, is encoded as ones and zeros, okay? High and low voltage. And so transistors, we have two types of transistors. N-channel, which means that the, um, if the, so you have a negative, ch negative charge forming in the semiconductor to allow current to flow between the source drain. In order for that transistor to turn on, you need positive charge on the gate to turn on the transistor. So this is only on if the gate voltage is higher than the source voltage. Now we have another type of MOS transistor, which is P-channel, so it's positive charge in the channel. And in order to induce positive in the charge in the channel to connect the source drain, the gate voltage must be negative compared to the source. So the gate voltage must be lower than the source voltage for the P-channel transistor to turn on. 
Now we always design a circuit to have complementary pairs of N-channel and P-channel transistors. So this is why it's called CMOS. This is the simplest CMOS circuit here where the drain terminal is tied together. Now for the N-channel device, the source terminal is, is at the lowest possible potential. But for the P-channel device, the source potential is at the highest possible potential. So the gates are tied together. Let's say one example, we have low voltage, so uh, coded zero at the input. Now that means there's no voltage applied in the end channel device here. So that channel, that this transistor is off. However, the gate voltage is lower than the source voltage for the P-channel device. So that device is on. Okay, so this device now, the P-channel device is connecting the output to VDD. So for zero volts input, the output is high. Okay? Now if we change the input to be high, what happens is the end channel device turns on, because now there's a gate to source voltage difference, and that this transistor discharges the output, changes the output voltage to ground, to zero. And so the output voltage goes to zero. So the, the more current that this transistor conducts, the faster this circuit operates. Okay, so we'd like, to, that's, this is why we'd like to have high on state current. Now notice here, the P-channel device is off because the gate to source voltage difference is zero. However, uh, okay, so this is the way a basic uh, circuit works and this is a, a symbol for this inverter. If the input is low, the output is high. If the output is, if, if the input is high, the output is low. Now, a complicated ch computer chip has much more uh, complex functions. So this is just one example showing a more complex function. We call it a NAND, not AND. So only if the two inputs are high, high voltage applied to A and B, so the end channel devices turn on, will the output go down to ground. Otherwise, if either A or B is low, then one or more of these transistors, these P-channel transistors, is on, connecting the output to the high voltage. Okay. So high voltage is in, represents a one, and low voltage represents zero. Now most of the chips, uh, most of the uh, transistors on a computing chip have memory. Okay, so this is a static memory cell that I show here. It basically comprises two inverters cross-coupled like this. So you can have stable um, state. One side can be low and the other side high, or one, the left side is high and the other side low. These are two stable states and you can connect some transistors to access these memory storage nodes in a, an array, a, a rows and columns of memory cells like this. Okay, so a static memory cell comprises six transistors. Now the main thing I wanted to show here is even if you're just storing information, these, these inverters are operating. Notice, as I mentioned, the transistor has off-state leakage current. For the P-channel device, it's supposed to be off, but it's leaking current and this end channel device is on, so it would just allow current to flow. So even when a computing chip is not doing any computation, you're wasting energy because current is just flowing from the power supply to ground. So this is the fundamental issue with CMOS technology. Now we can save power by lowering the supply voltage, um, so we don't have to charge up or discharge as much, uh, but what happens is the circuit operates more slowly, and that means other gates in your, in your chip will have to wait longer for a function to be completed. And so the amount of energy wasted due to just static power dissipation goes up as we lower the supply voltage. So fundamentally, if we add the total amount of energy needed to perform any computing function, you have to add the, the switching energy and the, just the leakage energy. And therefore, there's always a fundamental energy minimum. That means you cannot be more energy efficient than shown here at the, red, at the yellow dot. Now the FinFET, which Professor Shin mentioned earlier, we developed at first at Berkeley over 20 years ago. And so this is the IV, the current versus the gate voltage characteristic. The FinFET is just a transistor, but the shape of the silicon is, is like a fin, like a shark fin. And so as long as the width of that silicon fin is smaller than the gate length, this transistor can operate um, much more uh, better because you can actually turn it, the gate can control the current better. So you get steeper uh, turn on characteristics. So we can actually operate the FinFET at lower voltage and still have good on current for the same off current. So this is the secret of the FinFET. 
you can actually operate it at lower voltage and still have good um, performance, and so you have better energy efficiency with FinFET. So um, Intel was the first to put this into large high volume manufacturing, and um, it's, it's used in the most advanced chips today. Now that's what we call a three-dimensional transistor. Today we actually are starting to see three-dimensional integrated circuits. We have chips that are stacked on top of each other and interconnected to really enhance the functionality of the uh, computing system. And because this is uh, you know, sponsored by SK Hynix, I should mention a good example of three-dimensional integration of transistors is three-dimensionally integrated NAND flash memory technology. And uh, so today we actually have many layers of, depending on how you manufacture it, many layers of transistors that are stacked on top of each other um, to increase the number of transistors per chip. Interestingly, this works well because the, the uh, silicon is actually vertically oriented and it's not even single crystalline silicon, it's polycrystalline. And it's cost effective because you use one step to pattern all the all of the um, the gates gate layers in every single in every single memory layer. So this kind of um, technology advancement really is not making transistors smaller and smaller to fit more of them on a chip. It's stacking more and more on top of each other to enhance the functionality of a chip. And so this kind of technology advancement requires not only smaller smaller and smaller feature sizes, but also deeper and deeper, uh, taller and taller etches. So this is actually quite a significant technological achievement. Okay, so let me explain why then, so now that we know there's a fundamental limit in energy efficiency, let's think about how we can overcome that fundamental limit. We can get some inspiration looking at how far the human, uh, humankind has come. This, this is a plot showing the number of calculations per second by a computer per constant dollar. So for the same amount of money, how much computational power can you get, computational abil ability? And this starts in 1900 and goes to 2015. So this is really almost um, 120 years following some exponential improvement in computing capability. So we can see here, interestingly, the human brain has some computational cap capability and, and so people expect someday computing devices can be more capable than the human brain. Um, but the other thing I wanted to point out here is that over the last century, more than one century, the kind of switching devices were not, were actually different, were changing. So in the 1950s and 60s was when the transistor was invented and the integrated circuit was invented. But before that, the in industry used vacuum tubes as switching devices. Before that, they used um, relays, solid state relays, and before that they use mechanical switches. So this just shows that maybe we should be looking at a different type of switch looking forward. So what my research group has done in recent years is going back to look at a mechanical switch. But today we can make a mechanical switch using the same manufacturing process that we use for integrated circuits. So we can make the mechanical switches very, very small. Okay, so in 1900, the mechanical switches were very large, so they were slow, they were not energy efficient, they were not reliable. It turns out that if we make mechanical switches as small as transistors, they become much more reliable. Very interesting. So this is a cartoon showing, again, um, a switch with a gate that controls the current flowing between the source and drain. But for a mechanical switch, we can make it with a, purposely with an air gap between the source and the drain. So this way we can get zero leakage. So remember the fundamental energy efficiency limit of CMOS technology is because of leakage current. So now a mechanical switch has zero leakage current, so it does not have that fundamental limit, energy efficiency limit. To turn on this mechanical switch, we again, just like a transistor, we apply a voltage to the gate, that induces electric field, and that electric field induces electrostatic force to actuate this movable electrode into contact. So once contact is made, current suddenly begins to flow. So this, notice the gate voltage scale here. Uh, today's transistors operate with at least half a volt. So one half volt is a minimum amount of voltage needed to turn on and off a transistor. Here we're talking about 50 millivolts. So it's 10 times less voltage than a transistor to turn on and to turn off. Okay, so when we turn off, 
we just remove the voltage on the gate, the spring restoring force of this mechanical structure pulls it out of contact. But it does have to overcome the, um, oops, the adhesive force, right? When there's two, two materials in contact, there's some adhesion. So that's why there's some hysteresis here. It doesn't turn off at exactly the same voltage that it turns on. But still, this, this is an experimental demonstration that a mechanical switch can operate at 10 times lower voltage and have zero leakage energy. So this way, we can achieve much, much better energy efficiency if we use mechanical devices. OK, so how do we make these mechanical devices? As I mentioned, we just use a conventional process that is developed for integrated circuits. We start with a silicon substrate, deposit, and pattern using conventional techniques, a sacrificial layer like this. Then we deposit the structural layer, the movable layer, and we can pattern that. And then the last step is to selectively remove the sacrificial layer. Okay, and this way now that film can move up and down. Okay, so it turns out the semiconductor industry in the CMOS chips has already introduced these air gaps. Over time, as the industry has advanced the um, the type of the transistor, like from planar transistor to FinFET, it also has advanced the all the layers of metal wires that interconnect all those billions of transistors together. So the most advanced technology for Intel um, actually has air gaps. This is a cross-sectional view of a chip. It has air gaps between the metal lines. So we can actually make use of the state-of-the-art technology for semiconductors and make mechanical switches using these metal layers, these metal wires that are already there in the manufacturing process to interconnect the transistors. So this is what we call um, reconfigurable interconnect transit technology. Okay, so these are those the switches can be integrated on top of the CMOS. All right, so one disadvantage of mechanical switches is that they're slower than transistors. We have to mechanically move something up and down. Maybe it can switch on and off within um, 10 nanoseconds. Now, a transistor turns on with picoseconds. So really, we have to think new architecture, right? Um, one advantage of a mechanical switch, this is a plot of the time it takes to program a non-volatile memory device, like a NAND memory device, as a function of the energy. So all of the non-volatile memory devices used in production today require much more energy to operate than a mechanical switch. So therefore, we think that mechanical switches actually would be best used for non-volatile memory t uh, applications. So I'm going to give you just a few examples here. Oh, and another thing is, in order for mechanical switch, it's, it's actually larger than a transistor. But to save area, we can actually orient it this way, so it takes up very small amount of area on a chip. Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you. So these are the metal layers, many metal layers in the you know to interconnect all the transistors. We can shape some of the metal layers to form an actuation electrode. So we can apply a voltage here to attract this movable electrode to the left, or we can apply a voltage to the electrode here to attract the electrode to the right. So we can actually make this switch contact either data line zero or data line one. Okay, so this is basically what my research group has been working on in recent years. This is a cartoon. We have a chip, CMOS chip with metal interconnects from the foundry. And we can actually use the upper layers to act as an etch mask. So we can etch away the oxide in between the metal lines and undercut it to allow this to move. And so my research group has experimentally demonstrated a movable um, back end of line uh, mechanical switch like this. So uh, because of lack of time, I will all skip this. But basically, we've demonstrated experimentally using a conventional CMOS process that we can move the interconnect back and forth to change the functionality of the CMOS chip. So let me give you just one example of what can you do with this technology. If we have these movable switches integrated with transistors, what we can do is we can store information in you know, rows and columns. Um, one, one column represents uh, one string of data, okay? So one, one, zero, zero. So notice that the beam in the first row is connected to a data, one, data line one line. The second row is connected to data line one also. In the third row, is con the beam is connected to data line zero and the last row connected to data line zero. So this is how we store well, one, one, zero, zero. So every single column stores some information like this. 
So one of the common uh, functions that a chip performs is to, uh, to match information. So let's say we'd like to identify an address or identify an image. That means we want to match, do some uh, matching function. So let's say we'd like to find which column has a matching string, 1100. So it only takes two steps. Well, first step is just to find out which columns have matching zeros. Okay, so which columns have zeros in the last two rows? So the way we do this is we apply a voltage, a small voltage to the data line one lines, and then we turn on the rows that are supposed to have zero. Now, if any of those rows is storing a one, right, that means the current will flow because the data line ones are charged. So that means any column that is conducting current does not have matching zeros. Okay? So we can eliminate those columns. The next step is just to find, same thing, find which columns have matching ones in the first two rows. So here, what we do is now we apply voltage to data line zero lines. We um, then look at the two rows that are supposed to have ones, turn on those rows, and see which columns conduct current. If it conducts current, that means it's storing a zero, not a one, and so we can eliminate those columns. So in two steps, we can actually um, determine which, col wh which column is storing the string that you are interested in. Now this, we did a, um, a theoretical study. Let's say we have a computer chi a chip that stores eight gigabytes, gig gigabits of memory. It would take only 300 nanojoules and less than one nanosecond to find, uh, to identify which string um, is, where the string is stored on your chip. Now, that's not meaningful unless I tell you, today with conventional computer processors, a chip and a DRAM chip to store the information, it would take 90 millijoules. So this is like a thousand times more energy and 80 milliseconds. So it's, you know, many orders of magnitude more time, many orders of magnitude more energy to perform the same function, okay? Uh, because of time, I'm gonna skip this. There's another, <clears throat> another example where instead of calculating the answer, you can look up the answer if you store the answer in the memory. And with the, the mechanical reconfigurable switches on top of CMOS, we actually can uh, implement a lookup table with much smaller area and read orders of magnitude faster and read with much less energy. So those are just two quick examples. The final example I wanted to mention is we can encode information differently in a chip in the future. So at UC Berkeley, Professor uh, Roy Chowdhury has been working on this for more than 10 years. If we use phase rather than voltage level, so I talked about how CMOS works, you store high voltage or low voltage for one and zero. But another way you can encode information is in an oscillating signal, right? So you have, this is a voltage versus time. We have, um, this is a signal, okay, that's oscillating up and down and we look at this reference. So there's a reference oscillating signal here, this purple, you see? So there's two stable p uh, uh, configurations here. The, the signal can be out of phase with the reference signal, or it can be in phase, right? It's, it's reaching the peak at the same time as the reference signal. So this is one way, a different way you can encode information. Rather than high voltage, low voltage, you can en encode it in in phase, out of phase. So it turns out that there's some interesting computing architectures that are enabled by these os arrays of oscillators to perform functions much faster and with much less energy. So I want to come back to the mechanical switch. Turns out that a mechanical switch can be a, an oscillator, a very compact oscillator. So here we have a, a gate electrode that controls the current flowing between the source and drain. Now, if we apply a voltage to the gate, so that there's an electrostatic force between the gate and the source to pull, you know, to pull the uh, source and the, into contact with, this, with the drain. But if we purposely make the gate voltage less than the turn-on voltage, and then we apply a voltage to the drain, the drain actually overlaps with the source. So that also induces some small electrostatic force. That force can be enough to cause the switch to turn on. But if this switch turns on, then this voltage here starts out at VDC, this voltage will, if the switch turns on, this voltage will come down to zero. But if, the, if this voltage goes to zero, then electrostatic force goes away, okay? So that means the switch turns on, okay? Current flows, voltage discharges, 
so the voltage drops down, but then the electrostatic force goes away, so the switch turns off. So it'll just turn on and off, on and off by itself, just applying a DC voltage. And so these are measured voltage waveforms. We apply the gate voltage, and now this relay turn, just the output just oscillates by itself. Right, so this is a promising direction, I think, for enabling non-conventional computing architectures that can achieve certain functions much more energy efficiently um, and faster. So to conclude then, the examples that I showed you really do not follow the standard hierarchy. We actually look at new technology, new devices, and we directly apply them to the specific algorithms um, and new architectures. So rather than a hierarchical approach to innovation, we really need um, a, a co what we call co-design. So the algorithms um, and really need to consider the, the actual devices and the advanced materials we need to implement those devices. And really, today we're moving more and more towards specialized processors, where you have like tensor processor unit, graphical processor unit for AI and for graphics. In the future, the, the materials, the transistors or the switches, the circuits, the architecture will all have to be co-optimized for specific um, applications. So that's the new paradigm. Uh, rather than transistor scaling, we will have to rely, rely more and more on innovation, but with co-design across all those layers of abstraction. And only in that way can we achieve dramatic improvements in performance and energy efficiency, as, uh, as I showed in the very quick example that I had time to show. And so I think with that, I'm, I'll be happy to take questions, and I would just like to share the vision that um, you know, Chairman Choi, Choi mentioned that we want to have AI, you know, pervasive computing, and we want it to benefit, the, or enrich lives, right, to benefit society. And so if we can achieve much more energy efficient, much more higher performing um, computing devices, then we can have smart, you know, infrastructure like um, electricity, but also, you know, uh, can control things from transportation and, and, you know, buildings, hospitals, and so on. So really the future looks very bright if we can collaborate together um, to, with the, the same goal of um, increasing social value. So thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'll take questions later.